Hey, and welcome back to the quest for future creativity. It's been way too long and I'm really, really eager to get back into telling you about creativity and so on. And this, this episode is going to be a bit different because in some way, I think we are lacking an overview, sort of a creative sort of a framework for what, what is it we are trying to do. And I want to go back in time actually and make a rerun because in 2020, I had the extreme honor of uh, being invited to do a TEDx talk and I received this book and I went through sort of a speaker's course uh, that TEDx has uh, developed and uh, I got to make a speech as at DTU which is a Danish technical university and um, you, must, uh, you must know that it, it was in the middle of uh, Corona so there was no audience there was a few people who were sort of simulating uh, that they were clapping and I was looking at the screen here and I had to sort of engage with the audience who were not there. So I really want, uh, I want, really want to retell uh, the TEDx uh, sort of um, presentation and put some extra notes on it and so on and also show, show the slides in the order that actually was supposed to be because it was a bit difficult to control the slides at the same time as trying to sort of be on the stage. So uh, with no further ado, uh, let's go into TEDx 2020-2020 and make the sort of the connect the dots to where we are today. And, you know, I'm the kind of creative that really wants to try to put everything into visuals. And I had to try to see how can I get everybody to think or look at the world the same way I do. So I had to find some kind of a simple visual setup to to explain and um for that reason uh i would i would first love you to get into the same same mindset that i'm in uh and this is actually a little uh exercise i want you to either you can uh, visualize it uh, or you can take a piece of paper and then you can do what i'm doing here you take a piece of paper and then you make a dot here and you write A, and you make a dot here, and you write B. Okay, and now I give you the simplest task in the world. You have to make a line, a continuous line, that goes from A to B. So in your mind, try to do this. Try to visualize this, or do it on a piece of paper. You can actually shut off the video now, and then do that exercise. And if you have done that, I will do uh, the exercise afterwards when you come back. But let's see. Now I'm going to do uh, two different versions of this line. Okay, are you ready? This type of line is, of course, the way we are, we are, we are taught to think in the Western world. Go as fast from A to B as you, as you can and be as effective as possible. This is a straight line and you're gonna get, you're gonna get a reward when you get to this point. But if you write anything else in A and B, if you write birth and death, then it becomes a totally different perspective. So um, if you drew this line, I just wanna show you what kind of line you could have been drawing. So here you have A and here you have B. And when you start out here, just think about that you have this full piece of paper to fill out. And you, you know you have to make as much time as possible before you get to B. So let's see what you can do. You start out, you could research this uh, corner. You could uh, be at the beach with the ball and you could play around and you could be happy and you could have the sun or maybe a flower, and you could have a sailing ship here. Oh, that was really nice. That was an experience. And then you have the sky. You have an aeroplane. And you go to a... Oh, this is an island in the sky. So you can go there, and you can have an experience, and you can have like a pirate with a pirate's hat. And let's see what's down here. Whoa, that's... Uh, oh, you meet somebody. Ah, what could that be? You maybe you uh, go into a 
you fall in love or whatever. And uh, what I'm trying to say here is, I would actually love to see a piece of paper where you try out every corner and you actually, you almost, the better you are, you stay away from the bee as far as possible. Because at one point, and you don't know, suddenly you're here and you have to make this. And then you have to look at your paper and say, what did I do with this chance? What did I do with creativity? What did I do with my life? So this is what it's all about. And um, with this small uh, task, I'm going to go into uh, the actual TEDx talk uh, and try to put some perspective on this. I came on stage. I was totally nervous. There was a full crew of, uh, of uh, technicians running the show because it went all out all over the world. And there was really, really clever scientists in medicine and in physics and in uh, green energy and so on having the other talks. And I was in the middle there talking about creativity. So it's like uh, I have to get you into this mindset of uh, how I see the world. And um, so I had to sort of start with the brain, which is the most amazing thing we, we, we all share. And it can do amazing things. It can actually time travel and it can be, uh, you can actually turn it uh, positive or negative in a, in a flash. So how do you make a picture of the brain that makes sense when it comes to creativity and the serious part of life? So I had to look at the brain and say, we have the left side and we have the right side. And um, I, want to see if, I want to see if I can put this into a, a visual picture that, that, is, um, that maybe makes you think a little di bit different about the two sides of the brain. I know there's a lot of debate about left and right and how things influence, but let's just go with this. You have the left and the right side. I want to split them up because I want to make a point here. If you split them up, you get two shapes. And what I see here is you have the right side, which is the creative, uh, or that is how it's sort of a, it's perceived um, in general science and so on. Then you have the, the left side, which is sort of the, the serious one where you have all the structure and so on. And I'm splitting them up into the known and the unknown. And I've colored them in white and blue because I want to make a point here. I want to call them totally different names. The white one is called the boat and the blue one is called the sea. And now if you take these two shapes, put them together, you actually get a working model for the way of thinking about creativity. You have a boat in sort of a body of water. And uh, so the boat can sail around here. It can uh, move a bit. It can get sort of emotional with waves and so on. And it can be calm. And generally you have a piece of, you know, you have some water that you can, you can jump into. And uh, it's pretty controlled, this thing. And now when I look at adult uh, people, a lot of them, they tend to sort of say, you know, the more control I have, the better the more I can shrink the sea or maybe grow the boat, the better situation, because then the boat is rock solid. It doesn't go into, uh, it doesn't make any waves. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't shake me up. It doesn't make me seasick. It's just uh, more and more um, secure. But talking about creativity, this situation that you see on the picture is not very good. And when you suddenly stand in a situation where you need creativity to fix something, then you see that your boat is basically not able to move anywhere. But this is the situation if you actually think of creativity as the total asset, uh, the total uh, source of youth uh, that we have um, in our brain. You can make the sea of creativity grow, actually. And your boat becomes a little place of security that floats around on the top. And if you dive into this sea of creativity, uh, you can go on pretty amazing adventures. And the great thing is, the only thing you need is this, this little equipment. Or you can have another uh, type of expression. Maybe you ride, maybe you uh, knit, maybe you do uh, modeling. Maybe you take photography, maybe you, but, but you have some kind of thing that you can hold on to while you're underwater. 
And uh, I chose the pencil, which is uh, the most simple tool you can imagine. And you just need a piece of paper. So um, this slide shows uh, that the brain is uh, weightless and it can travel at the speed of thought. And uh, also it, uh, it is an endless uh, possibility for developing your skill because you are you're not using any uh, you any any resources it's basically i think the most sustainable type of energy you can get and uh, this is just a little example i have this drawing from when i was 4 years old i actually don't know if it's an astronaut or if, uh, a diver but uh, this is uh, done with uh, an orange uh, marker uh, at that time and this other uh, drawing is done a few years ago showing sort of the freedom you get when you when you have the pencil and you actually you, you get to understand how you can uh, use shapes and and color and so on to to create something on a flat piece of paper so i just want to say my adventure started in uh, the open ocean and it has a lot to do with water i basically think that water is the creative substance and it is the yeah it's the total magic of this uh, planet it's the only thing that sets us apart from the moon and all the other uh, sort of gray and, and uh, uninhabitable uh, planets in the universe. Or they are full of lava and uh, uninhabitable in that way. The water is our, it's our blood. And uh, this was what started me off. It was actually Jacques Cousteau and his adventures into, uh, into the ocean. And it started out with his TV series the voyage to the edge of the world. Water is a magic, it's a magical substance. And uh, I think it, it gives us the feeling of freedom and creativity. And I was totally, uh, I was totally sort of <laughs> taken by water when I saw the uh, Jacques Cousteau adventures. And uh, by chance, this copy of National Geographic was uh, at my grandparents in the, in their house and I every time I went there it's a, I think it's the earliest memory I have of of looking in <laughs> in a magazine and was this great great uh, article about uh, Jacques Cousteau uh, and his attempt to live underwater so yeah that's one of the building blocks for a lot of later creativity and um, then you're on this you know I'm going back to this uh, visualization where you are on the boat and uh, your parents are saying, okay, now you had to give it an education, you had to get a job, you had to find your way in life. And basically, I just wanted to jump into the water. I just wanted to draw. I just wanted to see how far I can take this. Uh, I, probably I was pretty nerdy. And, uh, but I also saw a lot of, uh, sort of adventure with the, with the drawing. So that was a lot of, uh, of uh, sort of, um, what do you call them? I got a lot of sort of extra experiences by drawing and had my role like like being the nerdy guy who would draw pictures and uh, make things on paper. So when I was in this water situation, uh, I suddenly spotted something in this water uh, of creativity. It was yellow, it was bright, and it was sailing towards me. And uh, I've symbolized this with a yellow submarine and it has a great uh, sort of text on the side saying advertising. Because when you're looking for a job and you're in the situation of being creative, then this uh, submersible uh, creative uh, place that's called advertising is, is the most amazing place. So I actually, I uh, try to uh, swim towards this uh, amazing vehicle. And uh, I actually managed to get in there. I managed to land a job at a really, really cool agency. And I didn't know anything about advertising. So by pure luck, uh, the last place I, I asked for a job, they actually had, had sort of, a, they, they needed uh, somebody who could draw. And I didn't have any other skills than drawing. So I started out there and walking into the office, I, uh, I noticed that they had, um, they had uh, a really great Danish brand standing on the shelves. It was not the... Uh, R2D2 at that time, but it was uh, Lego characters, uh, and um, I think the first test drawing I did was a minifig 
wearing a big uh, sweatshirt. Uh, I did that sort of in a, in crayons and so on. Uh, and I think that was sort of the, the entrance uh, ticket to that place. And um, yeah, it turned out they had uh, the greatest, most creative client in this agency, uh, the Danish company Lego. And uh, yeah, I ended up staying there for 28 years uh, and being co-owner of the agency and having the most amazing adventures there. But also the most amazing challenges, basically. Because the actual month that I got this job, I had an experience where I I was lying in my bed at, in the morning looking at the clock uh, radio and I noticed I had a blind spot on my retina. I couldn't see the center part of my of my visual field uh, and it didn't go away when I uh, sort of stood up and and went to the agency uh, and I tried to sort of say, well, that's a passing thing, but it didn't, it didn't pass. So um, you can actually say I've illustrated this about uh, the dark spot uh, or the blind spot, uh, which is um, which is basically your biggest challenge, but you are trying to look away from it. You're trying to avoid your biggest biggest challenges. But what I experienced is that actually my biggest challenge was also my biggest inspiration. So this this TEDx talk is basically about taking your weakness, taking your personal uh, story about your struggles and your challenges and turning them into creative fuel. And I think if you look at anybody who's created uh, great stuff, they have actually managed to make it into something uh, creative, fruitful and something that could sort of give value to other people. So what was this? Uh, blind spot about. Uh, I went to uh, the people who do glasses because I think, oh, I need glasses. It was not that. And they say, you may, you, you might have to go to a doctor to get it checked. I went to the doctor. I went to the eye doctor and he ended up sending me to uh, this next slide, the dark spot. And suddenly uh, I went into uh, an MR scanner at a big uh, hospital in Copenhagen. And um, you can say that that was a really <laughs> mind-blowing and uh, life-changing experience because um, everything was not the way it was supposed to be. There was actually something sitting in there and uh, pressing on my uh, pituitary gland and on my visual cord. So this dark spot was actually something that I had to do something about. and. Uh, I had these three days where I was at home waiting for the results and um, went back to the to the hospital and got the the amazing result that it was not cancer and uh, actually this this uh, thing could be treated uh, with the with the medicine so that was like getting your life back uh, when I walked out of that uh, hospital. Um, this next picture uh, shows uh, the picture I brought home which was the picture of uh, the uh, the tumor, which was in, in my brain. And uh, it was actually sitting in the most impossible place on the body, on the human body when it comes to operation. So you actually had to go through the nose and you may have a chance of getting it out, but you may also uh, damage something. Um, so yeah, that was not the picture you wanted to bring home. And thinking about this, I just landed my dream job at the agency and it was this amazing world of uh, creativity and uh, advertising and uh, you know everything was open there and at the same time my life was sort of getting shut down from the inside so i think that that uh, double-sided experience has actually shaped uh, my uh, my way of thinking and uh, i actually got uh, i went from attitude to gratitude because you never know what you're going to get around the corner so you know you have to be in the now you have to be in the present and you have to use uh, your challenges as as creative fuel so um i've had this little phrase saying to be or not to be that's all a matter of chemistry because when you come into using medicine like i did for 10 years you really understand that 
it's all about the balance of, of uh, chemistry in your body and uh, the hormones and all the different things that are circling around. You get really humble when you think about all the systems that need to work in your body. And this little tiny thing that didn't work was causing all the trouble. So I was actually told to eat these, uh, these pills um, and uh, one time every evening, which meant that I would uh, get really nauseous and I would get uh, like I was in a, in a cocoon almost. And when I woke up in the morning, I was really feeling tired. I was feeling uh, like I was going to throw up and I had to sort of crawl my way into the agency. And when I went um, into the agency, I was like, I didn't go to the coffee machine or go to talk to the others. A lot of the mornings I crawled directly into the toilet, into the bathroom of the agency. And luckily it was really a nicely designed bathroom uh, because I lied down on the floor and uh, I found out that you can be creative in many ways because uh, this uh, role became my uh, favorite sort of um, pillow. So uh, yeah, products can uh, be used in, in different ways. And I think that uh, almost lying on the side uh, for uh, an hour or an hour, hour and a half, <laughs> is a lot of mornings in that agency and the just thinking about, you know, why me, you know, I got, went through all these things about how, how sad and how uh, angry I could be about the situation. And at some point you just get to the point where you, okay, I need to use this for something. So I started to sort of, uh, maybe think in, in new ways and new uh, ways of, of turning things into creative fuel. And of course, thinking about the body and thinking about all the chemistry that, that has to work, you know, that that puts some, some different layers in, into my mind. And um, the lucky thing was that I got a client that, that was called Lego Technic, which was a lot about technical stuff, technical parts. This was an amazing client. It had all the gears, it had all the cool bricks. Uh, of course, we had done a lot of different Lego uh, uh, launches with the Lego, uh, all the different minifigs. And actually, look at that one. That just came out as a really big character. This is a special product. And and this was, this was the first minifig that actually had a face because normally they just had a generic face with a smiling mouth and the two eyes. But now suddenly there was a character and it was an amazing move for Lego that they actually went into storytelling with their minifix. And for us in the agency, suddenly we had to tell a story. And actually, on a funny note, I just found this catalog from uh, 1989, which was one of my first uh, years I gave out stuff. And what you can see here, <laughs> The Lego ad with the ship and the red beard here in the foreground. So doing the whole campaign about that was one of my first job at the agency. And now this is coming out, which is really amazing. And it has all the different, all the cool details as well. So I'm definitely going to do a video with this one with all the different materials, but uh, let's get to that later on. Um, so I got this Lego Technic, uh, which was amazing. And in some way, it started to shape uh, the way I'm thinking about, you know, I was built, we were building cars, we were building, uh, not building, we were advertising uh, cars and so on. But what if you could build a body? Because what I was struggling with was constantly having to sort of rethink my, my own situation and thinking, how could I change this biological problem into something that could be used creatively? So I was actually feeling like a weak robot crawling into this uh, this bathroom in the morning. And uh, luckily, around 10 years later, where I've, uh, you know, 10 years of working at the agency and having a great life, but having this illness at the same time, there was a new medicine that I could get as an injection. And that actually meant that I could start to rebuild this crawling robot. Uh, and I was thinking about myself a bit like that. Um, and then amazing things happen because Lego actually came out with this product line called Craze Products and Lego Technique was the perfect place to use that because it was product coming in and out of the market. 
we did some tests uh, in 95 with trying to do ball joints and do storytelling and do robots. And this be didn't become a product. It was called Cybots. It was sort of a test project. But in uh, 98, uh, the first product came that we had to sort of try to do a campaign for, and that was called Slicer of Robots. Then came Robo Riders, and in the third round of this, there was uh, these amazing uh, robots, and the idea was that there was some kind of story that they were, maybe they were sort of uh, natives on, a, on an island, um, this was just around the time when the Robinson expedition was on television. So there was a lot about this being on an island and having to survive and so on. And at the same time, uh, we were looking into a situation where we wanted to try to see, could we do this impression that this was a big story we were doing? Because we had just come from Lego Star Wars and telling, you know, the most epic uh, adventure in the world together with the uh, Lucas of course and having a Lego angle on that but now we were trying to do our own story together with uh, with the great team in Villa and what if we could do a legend that seemed like it was a movie just coming and just give it sort of the full full blown uh, movie treatment with with the 3D animations and uh, all the new technology with CD-ROMs and online presence with the Masanui online game. So this story came up and then suddenly the dots connected. Because when I saw this canister or the idea for this canister that already was out with, with the slices uh, and also with Robobiters, but then but with Bionicle it really came full circle. And in some way this actually looked like the, like the capsules I had been eating for 10 years. Uh, so. So suddenly everything clicked, and uh, what if this was actually medicine with some kind of uh, hero or uh, active robot inside that had to go on a mission, and the mission would be inside a giant structure, which could be a body or a big robot that that uh, had some kind of illness that had to be saved. So suddenly we had this micro structure of the story with the heroes, and their perspective would be, this is an amazing big world and we have to find out what the what our task is. At the same time, we have the structure of the big robot, which is a, on a totally different level and may even be like a legend level. But these two things was the perfect uh, story engine. And this new Nest picture shows uh, how it all sort of clicked together. We had this big robot. We had the the... Retruvian um, robot actually showing that the, this is a biological story. As you know, Bionicle is a combination of uh, biological and chronicle. So this would be a story about how biology actually shapes legends. And that is exactly what we have. We have a big robot onto this island. And we have some really, really small robots that has to find out where they are and what their task in this world is. And um, this whole thing became an amazing adventure for everybody on the team and for Lego and for trying out new stuff, new way of storytelling and, and media and so on. But actually at the same time, you could say that I was, I was starting to look at the world as, as something that could just be, uh, it was just one big playground. And I was trying to, uh, I was actually starting maybe to get this mental blind spot. Now I had had a physical blind spot with a uh, with a brain tumor, but the mental blind spot is almost uh, worse. And it, I could look at everybody around the world, also having this sort of, you know, what are we actually doing here? You know, we are, we are uh, creating this amazing um, world of opportunity, of creativity, of uh, consumption, uh, but there's something totally wrong so actually trying to say could i pull out from this advertising world and try to look at the world uh you know outside uh, the yellow submarine and when i did that this is actually a drawing when i when corona broke out i tried to do a visual that sort of said well we are all on the same cruise and now we're actually facing something that that could shake the boat 
or do we actually know that we are so connected? And I think that Corona made us see that and all the different crises we've been sailing into uh, the last couple of years have even more strengthened this, this sort of uh, visual <laughs> representation that we are extremely connected and we have to really come together as one uh, as one planet uh, to solve these problems. So this is a drawing of, uh, of that situation. And uh, yeah, being on a cruise was the perfect way of having a holiday until uh, people were actually stranded on cruise ships and couldn't get off uh, the boat because of uh, Corona. And then suddenly it shifted at 180 degrees. So this is a drawing of, uh, of sort of the world community in the shape of a cruise ship. And I think you can find yourself somewhere in here, even though you are, if you are in different places in the world, everybody should be on this boat. And um, this brings me to what is, the, what is the job now? What is the challenge? What is the blind spot? I think creativity is the most important human survival skill. And I think it's our greatest uh, opportunity to actually learn creativity both for ourselves, but also to be able to give uh, to other people without having to use a lot of uh, of uh, fuel and and consume a lot of stuff. The gift of creativity is is much more amazing and it's much more personal. So I really want to sort of say it's a great quest for humanity that that everybody train this this uh, this ability. We have to move from being or for looking for heroes that can solve the situation to actually look for heroes. And I know it's a bit sounds a bit strange, but I think the we has to become much more important than than the he <laughs> or the she. Um, and I think I can look at the world and see the, the people who actually solve problems for other than themselves. They are heroes. And they're often really sort of non-hero uh, characters. It's like uh, people who invent new medicine. It's like people who uh, who fight for uh, rights of the nature or for uh, or bio sort of extension and so on. Trying to, and I know there's a lot of politics in this and and things uh, and a lot of people on different sides. But but I think uh, being one humanity is uh, is what we should aim at. And I know it sounds. It sounds really uh, sort of um, banal, but uh, yeah, creatives unite. And I think that is what the uh, UN actually gave us. They gave us the global goals. And uh, I think this is an amazing gift for creatives because it's the biggest source of inspiration. If you want to look at challenges, you can just look at this. And this is a great thing because this is all the different global goals shaped as a ball. And the ball is actually something you can play with. So turning all these different challenges into something that's playable, that's exactly what storytelling can do. And that's what creativity can do. So uh, play with the ball. And uh, yeah, let's put this into action. And that is why we at Copenhagen Rig have set off on an adventure to create a new piece of storytelling that can actually involve as many people as possible and as many creative sources as possible. Rebel Nature is all about that. And this is a poster. It's been it's been a long journey. It's been a, it's actually sort of a message in a bottle, and it takes as long as it it takes to make it, because it's a story for the future. And I think uh, it's a message for the future. So the more people we can get involved in that, and actually see it as a as a quest into the future, a possibility for almost like a time travel. We can do a really good story and really put ourselves in there. I actually think we can show ourselves uh, for people who we are not going to meet in person, but we can actually tell them about our situations in amazing ways. And that is the connection from the past to the present to the future. So Rebel Nature is all about uh, storytelling across time and across uh, nationality uh, and actually trying to make this story universe that is a sort of a, it's a common uh, ground for creativity, but also for challenges facing 
everybody in everyday life. Um, so you can say we have uh, the future is the big sea of creativity and our earth is floating around in this. And uh, I hope everybody is uh, in on diving into the water and finding solutions and bringing the perfect tools for creativity. So um, yes, this was actually the, the TEDx talk uh, that I did um, at the DTU. And this is sort of uh, another version of that. And now you have sort of, you have the different points. You have the creativity starting point, which you can actually look at yourself and say, where could I start uh, with my creative journey? Then you have uh, the challenge that you'll meet. And it, it's, it's an individual challenge. You will meet different uh, problems of being creative or living from creativity or using it. Uh, and then what is the purpose? So you have these three things. You have the spark, you have the challenge, and then you have the, what are we using it for? And we are trying to, to sort of make this model into actually a, a, working, uh, a working company that can do creativity and actually also respect everybody's uh, different opinions and, and ways of, of being creative. So that is what Rebel Nature is about. That is what Lego is about because you can basically be creative and build anything with Lego. So that's an amazing, great uh, <laughs> collaborator to, to work with. And then, uh, yeah, of course, uh, we want to use all the new uh, production tools to do even greater uh, stuff. And uh, in a little while, we're going to do amazing stuff with this, uh, with this YouTube channel because we're going to invite creatives in here going to explore the new world of, of uh, creativity and tools for, for creative uh, uh, empowerment and much more. So stay tuned and uh, come back to the channel. It's, uh, it's going to be an amazing adventure, especially if you are in there. So see you very soon. Bye bye.